This video is brought to you by Magellan TV. We invite you to watch Magellan TV's new release, Yalta's Last Secret. This documentary uses authentic photo and video footage to explain how the Allies at the end of World War II handed over 2 million Russian, Ukrainian, and Baltic nationals to the Soviets. The winter resort of Yalta was the venue for the last of the Big Three. The conference was held in February 1945 at the Levadia Palace, where a secret pact was signed between Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin. Within just weeks, Stalin violated signed protocols that guaranteed democratic freedoms for the countries of Eastern Europe, and the Iron Curtain began to descend. The aim of the Yalta Conference was to shape a post-war peace, but as you'll see in our newest video about the Malayan emergency, the peace wasn't attainable everywhere. In 1948, a guerrilla war started in British Malaya between communists fighting for independence while Commonwealth forces fought to protect economic interests. Magellan TV releases 20 hours of brand new content like Yalta's Last Secret every week, so enjoy exploring over 3,000 documentaries, movies, and series, some in 4K high definition. Click the link in the description to try out Magellan TV. Get a one-month free trial and join us for the next Magellan TV documentary. The Malayan Emergency, 1948 to 1960. After the Second World War, the British colonial empire slowly began to disintegrate. The process started in Asia, with the British Raj becoming the independent nations of India and Pakistan in 1947. Britain chose to grant India its independence, as after the financial strain of World War II, the country could no longer afford to maintain its presence on a subcontinent to 400 million people. Moreover, Japanese expansion into Southeast Asia highlighted how inadequate Britain was in protecting its Asian colonies. More generally, perceptions of colonial power were fast changing as Gandhi, the leader of the Indian independence movement, was voted Time Magazine's Man of the Year in 1931, while newspapers detailed atrocities committed by the British. The result of this was that anti-colonial movements across the British Empire became inspired to push for their own national independence, as Britain seemed incapable of preventing its imperial decline. One of the most notable anti-colonial rebellions started in 1948, just one year after Indian independence, when Malaya became the focus of an insurgency led by the Malayan Communist Party, headed by Jinping and their Malayan National Liberation Army. The Malayan Emergency, also known as the Anti-British National Liberation War, lasted for 12 years until it ended in 1960. During that period, Malaya became yet another nation that gained independence from the British Empire. The Malayan Emergency was sparked by the severe economic problems of the colony after the Second World War. Prior to the war, Malaya's economy was reliant on the export of tin and rubber. Following the Japanese occupation of Malaya between 1942 and 1945, exports rapidly decreased, and many rubber plantations and tin mines fell into a state of disrepair. Therefore, when the Japanese surrendered in 1945, they left behind a country with a devastated economy, where unemployment was high and food was scarce. Malaya was also ethnically divided. Out of a total population of 5 million, native Malaysians made up 48% and Chinese 37%, with the remainder being significant groups of Indian minorities. Historically, there had been ethnic tension between the Malaysians and the Chinese, with the former believing that the immigrant Chinese were taking their jobs. As a result, vast Chinese shanty towns sprang up near the cities, but they had very few civil rights, and they were not even allowed to vote. The Malayan Communist Party took advantage of this situation to start a rebellion against the British government. At first, they organized strikes across the entire country. The British responded to these strikes with reprisals, including forced deportations of Chinese immigrants, which caused the strike organizers to resort to more militant means of resisting British rule. The emergency began with an incident in the town of Sungai Siput, where three young Chinese men killed three British rubber plantation managers at the Elfil Estate on June 16, 1948. These were the first shots to be fired in the conflict that was about to erupt. As a response to the incident, British High Commissioner Sir Edward Gent declared a state of emergency across the entire Federation of Malaya. 
a state of emergency banned the Malayan Communist Party and gave police the powers to detain suspected Communist Party members or those with left-wing sympathies. As a result, Malayan Communists had no other option but to retreat into the jungle, where they formed the Malayan National Liberation Army, also known as the MNLA. However, even though the Communists proclaimed the National Liberation of Malaya as their goal, most Malayans were not really interested in their cause. The Malayan National Liberation Army was formed on the basis of the communist guerrilla organization known as the Malayan People's Anti-Japanese Army. This group had operated during the final stages of World War II and was largely made up of Chinese immigrants who had faced severe discrimination under Japanese rule. During World War II, these communist soldiers were Britain's allies and were therefore provided with arms and equipment, which they turned against the British during the Malayan emergency. After the war, most of the weapons had been buried, only to be dug up when the emergency started in 1948. These weapons, mostly of British and Japanese origin, were in a very poor condition due to the damp and humid jungle conditions and the lack of any maintenance facilities. In 1948, the strength of the MNLA was around 5,000 men. This number eventually increased to around 8,000, with almost 90% of the soldiers being Chinese. Most of Malaya's Chinese shanty towns were located on the edges of jungles, which made them easy to access for the MNLA. Moreover, the Chinese, facing severe ethnic discrimination, were more dissatisfied with British rule than the Malaysians were. As a result of the ethnic tensions between the Chinese and Malaysians, very few Malaysians supported the uprising or joined the MNLA. Besides its armed forces, the Communists organized the People's Movement, or the Min Yuan. This force of 60,000 civilians was tasked with supporting the MNLA by supplying food, shelter, finances, and intelligence. They had no uniforms and very few weapons, but did have part-time armed units and assassination squads. The men of the MNLA were trained in jungle guerrilla warfare and had a lot of experience from fighting the Japanese. Aware of their limited resources and strength, the communists devised their own plan of action. In its first phase, they began with action against isolated estates, mines, and government buildings in small towns across the entire country. The second phase led to the formation of liberated areas, which would serve to supply food and act as training bases for new recruits. Finally, the third phase included taking the fight from the liberated areas to the towns and cities, and ultimately to the open battlefield. When the emergency started, the British only had three army battalions, six Gurkha battalions, and two battalions of the Royal Malay Regiment. These forces were not sufficient to fight against the communist insurgents, so reinforcements had to be brought in from the Commonwealth. The first soldiers that arrived in Malaya were conscripts of the British National Service, but as the emergency developed, troops from New Zealand, Australia, South Rhodesia, Fiji, Nyasaland, North Rhodesia, and Kenya were all brought to Malaya. Seven battalions were also added to the Royal Malay Regiment, making the security forces around 40,000 men strong. The Malayan police force was even larger. This unit was formed by the police commissioner of Malaya, Colonel Gray, in 1948. The Malaya police recruited local men for service as special constables and in the home guard. In 1953, both of these forces had around 290,000 servicemen. The primary role was to guard villages, farms, industrial facilities, and government buildings from any communist attacks. However, they also had special jungle squads, which took part in offensive actions against the insurgents. When the communists began their campaign of terrorist attacks against British targets, the British reduced their activities to protecting key industrial complexes, such as the country's tin mines and rubber plantations, as well as government buildings. This was done mainly because of limited military resources. During this period, the MNLA was able to perform up to 500 actions per month, mostly against British farmers, miners, and police stations. In April 1950, Lieutenant General Sir Harold Briggs was appointed as Director of Operations in Malaya. In this role, Briggs had the authority to coordinate police operations on behalf of the High Commissioner of Malaya. 
He also decided to change the British tactics, which had been based on defending key infrastructure, to a more offensive strategy. The first part of Briggs' plan was to disrupt Min Yuan, which would cut the communists off from their food supplies, finances, and intelligence. This was done by relocating more than 400,000 Chinese squatters from areas on the edge of the jungle to new purpose-built villages. These villages were surrounded by barbed wire, lit by floodlights, and guarded by a strong police presence in order to prevent the communists from approaching them. This resettlement program also disrupted the recruiting practices of the MNLA. The second aspect of Briggs's plan was to coordinate the army, the Malayan police, and civil authorities through a committee system. These representatives sat on the Federal War Committee and the State and District War Executive Committee, which allowed for more decisive action to be taken against the communist guerrillas. Finally, Briggs planned to militarily engage the MNLA in order to push the communists deeper into the jungle. However, the problem was that the British in Malaya still had insufficient forces to completely prevent the communists from attacking their targets. This was a particular problem in the southern region of Johor, where the communists were at their strongest. The communist threat was still strong by 1951, when on October 6, the MNLA assassinated the High Commissioner Sir Henry Gurney. The convoy that he was traveling in, which included his Rolls-Royce Silver Wraith with a ferret armored scout car, an open-back Land Rover with six Malayan policemen in it, and a police wireless van were ambushed by a group of 38 Malayan Communist Party guerrillas who opened fire with three Bren guns, Sten guns, and rifles. His car and the Land Rover came to a halt as they were riddled with bullets and their tires were shredded, and Gurney and five policemen were wounded. His wife and private secretary were cowering in the footwell of their car. So to draw the insurgents' fire away from them, he got out and staggered towards their attacker, shouting, this is the king's highway. But they fired at him anyway and killed him. The armored car managed to escape and brought back reinforcements to the scene. Chin Peng later announced that it was just a routine ambush and that they were unaware that the high commissioner was involved. In January 1952, General Gerald Templer was appointed as the new High Commissioner by the newly elected British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, who was dismayed to find that Britain was spending 56 million pounds per year on trying to cope with the crisis. With the conflicts appearing to be a stalemate, Templer applied the policy of hearts and minds, with the goal of gaining popular support amongst the local population in fighting the insurgents. The Malaysians were eager to side with the British to fight the Chinese-dominated MNLA, especially because they were promised independence after the communists were defeated. Templar began to ease tensions with the Chinese community in the new resettlement villages by introducing a program to build schools, medical clinics, and sewer systems. Templar also facilitated the arrival of reinforcements from other Commonwealth countries and the recruitment of more Malaysians into the police units. In this way, the High Commissioner finally had the strength to defeat the MNLA. Instead of large assaults, Templar concentrated smaller units that were specially trained in jungle warfare in selected areas for up to three months at a time. The plan was for search-and-destroy patrols to reduce the operational area of insurgents by establishing jungle forts. His strategy also saw the creation of honeypots, where British forces would appear to be off-guard and relaxed so as to encourage increased MNLA activity in a given area before being ambushed and apprehended. Templar's plan proved to be successful, as by 1953 the communists had completely lost the initiative. Less than 3,500 MNLA troops remained in the jungle, and more white or non-communist areas were created across the country. In white areas, the original state of emergency declaration, of which had been declared in 1948, was lifted. Realizing that they could no longer win the conflict, Jin Peng, the leader of the Malayan Communist Party, sought peace talks with the British. The negotiations were held on December 28, 1955, in the government-run English school at Baoling. The talks broke up, though, as representatives of the Malaya Federation rejected all of the demands set by the communists, because they were worried that the Communist Party would regain a prominent place in Malayan society. 
Chen Peng returned to the jungle and continued to fight, while also instigating other attempts to make peace, which also came to nothing. However, on August 31, 1957, Malaya became an independent country, and the MNLA lost their reason for existence. By this stage, their strength was only around 1,800 members, concentrated near the border with Thailand. On July 31, 1960, the Malayan government declared the conflict over, and Chin Peng fled the country for communist China. The emergency cost the lives of 6,710 communist fighters, with more than 4,000 others either captured or forced to surrender. The Malayan police lost 1,345 men, while Commonwealth forces lost 519 soldiers. Additionally, 2,478 civilians were also killed during the 12 years of the conflict.